Uh, hi everyone, this is Ethan speaking. Uh, Rich, uh, are you uh, about ready? Yeah, well, I'm ready. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone, and uh, I won't delay. I guess we could wait a second to have Matt uh, actually be able to hear us. Uh, but otherwise, we can uh, get started with Rich uh, giving his presentation, his rant or rave, or both, about uh, stuff. Oh, a few more people joining, but uh, I guess we can just get started and now jump in in a second. So, welcome, Rich. Thanks for joining us. All right. Thanks, Ethan. Um, yeah, I really like I like giving WebExes because I feel like, you know, it's just like uh, people are just kind of sitting in my office looking at my screen. Uh, although. Um, I guess you guys might be able to squeeze in here. It might be a little tight. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, catalog-driven reproducible workflows for ocean science. And uh, on the abstract, there was a longer title that involved something about sea level. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that, because <laughs> uh, something uh, more interesting came along to talk about that it's, st it's still a reproducible workflow for ocean science. But um, I wanted to mention right off the bat that um, I work for the USGS, who is uh, sponsoring, you know, my involvement with the Integrated Ocean Observing System, or otherwise known as IUSE. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. And um, I've been doing this work with Philippe Fernandez uh, in Brazil, and he is being funded by Secura, which is one of the regions of IUSE. Um, there really should be a whole bunch more people on here, um, and you'll see as we go along, that we're using contributions from a lot of different folks across the geoscience community, um, both here and abroad. So uh, I'm going to jump in here, and um, the uh, and tell you what I'm going to talk about instead of water levels. <laughs> um, this just came up a couple of days ago, and so it seemed more timely to talk about this um, because. You know, there's really no storms. Uh, there's no northeasters about to hit the East Coast. It's a quiet hurricane season. Um, so water levels, you know, they're important. But um, this was uh, uh, this will serve the same purpose. And actually, uh, so we thought, well, okay, so instead of t d using our uh, notebook for comparing water levels from models and observations, why not um, use it for temperature? And this came up because um, I was contacted earlier this week by one of the swimmers and organizers of the Boston Light Swim. So the Boston Light Swim has been going on since uh, 1907. It's an eight-mile swim from uh, the Boston Harbor Light out here all the way into uh, Boston Harbor. So this is one of the, this is actually um, from a GPS uh, wristband that one of the swimmers had last year. Um, it's about, it is eight miles. And actually, so this is the lighthouse out here See those, uh, see those um, kind of weird things in the distance? Those are actually the sludge digesters at the sewage treatment plant here. So it's basically, you know, twice as far as, are the, as those uh, tanks are away. It's a long way. And more importantly, uh, or maybe equally importantly, there's no wetsuit. And if any of you have swum in uh, the Gulf of Maine, you know that it's uh, – it's pretty chilly. So whether, you know, if it's 62 degrees, they're pretty good, although 62 degrees is, for me, I want to jump in the water and just jump right back out again. But they're good at 62 degrees. If it gets down to, like, 54 degrees, then they have some problems, and some people may choose not to race. They have to monitor everybody very carefully and make sure that they finish in time. So they really wanted to know how cold the water would be on Saturday, the day after tomorrow, when they start this race at 7 a.m. So I said, hey, no problem. We've got these, uh, these IU's forecast models, and we can predict the water temperature for you. So I did that. Uh, I, made a, I used an IPython notebook we had to um, just uh, grab some data from OpenDAP and plot it up. Uh, you know, it's, they like these currents, too, of course, because the tidal currents rip in and out of Boston Harbor. But they looked at these temperatures that were produced, and they said, oh, my God, uh, it's going to be 53 degrees. And um, and I said, uh, well, um, 
you know, uh, that's what the model says. <laughs> and uh, and they said, well, um, let's check what it says today. They told me, you know what, this model is it's it's uh, it seems to be under predicting the temperature. The temperature seems today when they actually looked at the uh, nowcast result instead of August 14th when they looked at today, they said, well, actually it looks like the water's warmer than that. So we said this was a couple of days ago. And we said, well, let's um, run our little notebook that compares the different models and see which models are doing better and if this is a consistent thing or, you know, try to find out a little bit more that's about what's going on here. So um, with that, um, I'm going to back off a bit before I show you that notebook and um, just make sure that you know that um, what I use is, I think most of you guys do, but it's, um, you know, it's 11 different regional associations. Uh, 17 different federal agencies all working together sort of across uh, state and academic lines trying to make the most of observing <laughs> systems and oceanographic models in, that are running in different regions to solve local regional problems. And so it, this, in a, I, you know, the way, the reason I'm participating in this is not only because I care about, um, you know, I'm an oceanographer and I, and I care about, uh, I think this is kind of a neat idea, but also because it represents, I think, sort of in a microcosm, all the issues or a lot of the issues that we face across the geoscience community in terms of dealing with different types of um, unstructured and structured grid model output, data from different sensors, and trying to put that all together into some kind of um, system that's easy uh, and, and effective to access. Um, and I should mention here that this, um, specifically when I mentioned before that SECURE was funding this, SECURE specifically has funded a model skill assessment project, uh, Deborah Hernandez and Vembu Subramanian have um, uh, put forward funds that are, are funding Philippe on that. Philippe on that. So, um, what kind of different, uh, what kind of uh, data are we dealing with? Um, well, actually, first of all, um, we're dealing with different observations and models, which I'll get to in a second. IUS basically says if you want to play in IUS, you have to provide web services, standard web services. So that's the only thing that they are going to allow you to supply. So we have that advantage in terms of being able to have standard uh, web access services. Um, and the data that we're serving can be can look like these curvilinear grid models in coastal regions that have these curvilinear coordinates like this in the horizontal, and they have these stretched vertical coordinates. So we're not dealing with rasters, right? We're not dealing with just satellite imagery or you know things that um, have fixed Z levels you have to provide the full 2D uh, latitude and longitude arrays, you know, and you have to be able to compute these vertical coordinates. And that makes dealing with this data in an interoperable way a little more tricky. We also have these unstructured grid models, triangle-based or tri tries and quads. This is a, um, actually the New England forecast model around Woods Hole. Um, I'm speaking to you from uh, the Woods Hole Research Center right about in here. And, um, and we also have um, we also have data from buoys, ships, gliders that we have to deal with. So we have time series and trajectories, as well as structured grid and unstructured grid. You know, luckily we have the CF conventions that help us um, actually uh, come up with a, a way of standardizing how you represent all that kind of information. Uh, you know, the OGC conventions actually don't provide that for us yet in terms of the curvilinear grids and the, the stretched vertical coordinates, but CF, the CF coordinates do. And, um, and the unstructured grid part, we have sort of extended CF um, with a, um, a U-grid uh, convention for how to specify data on those, on those triangular grids. So um, basically, uh, we have these two types of data that we're trying to integrate here in these, in these notebooks. Uh, in situ data and the web service that, OG, uh, that IUS um, approves for uh, uh, in situ data is the sensor observation service, OGC's sensor observation service, and for gridded output, like the model output, we have these uh, OpenDAP with climate uh, CF conventions. And deliver those through through OpenDAP and, um, and the encoding for the um, OGC sensor observation services, XML or CSV. So I'm going to, I'm not really going to talk about web map services today. Okay, so I think most of you know OpenDAP, but I just wanted to Kind of, if you're not familiar with sensor observation service, it looks a lot like the other OGC services in terms of it has get capabilities that tells you about 
you know what what the um, what the service has, and then you can. But one thing you can do with sensor observation service is you can say describe sensor and get some metadata about the particular sensor before you go ahead and get data through a get observation. Um, any uh, any questions at this point? Actually, okay. I'll keep on moving. Um, so um, we make a lot of use out of the Unidata Threads data server, um, and we put uh, both piles of files from models over here, as well as um, from buoys and um, you know gliders and things like that. Um, we can aggregate and standardize those piles of files through NCML, the NetCDF markup language, um, and the Threads data server understands NCML because it. It relies on NetCDF Java to get all that stuff into a common data model. So we have a common data model for grid, for U-grid, for time series, profile trajectories. And then once you've got these data in the common data model, Threads provides a variety of services that either Unidata built or have been built by others, so you can deliver the data out through OpenDAP with CF conventions. But if it's SOS data, the data amenable to SOS, like time series or profiles, um, you can, you can uh, use uh, NC, uh, SOS to serve them out through sensor observation service. And um, you can also, uh, thanks to uh, the work from NGDC, you can also get ISO metadata out. It converts the attributes in the NetCDF files or in the NCML into ISO metadata, which then can go into catalog services like uh, CCAN, PyCSW, GeoPortal Server, GeoNetwork, GICAT. Um, so you get the metadata out, and then the services, of course, you can consume with different um, libraries. Of course, NetCDF Java understands uh, the open app with CF conventions for Java-based applications. Um, and actually, um, NetCDF for Python um, doesn't understand CF, but um, actually Iris, the package Iris, which I should have put, in, put on here, um, does understand uh, CF conventions. I'll talk about those in a second. So. With that, um, with that um, we have all our services. So we have that's one thread server, but we have many thread servers across the IUS landscape. And what happens is the thread servers, as well as um, SOS services that are not um, from threads, like um, there's another um, uh, database driven SOS um, software called uh, uh, 52 North that provides uh, SOS capabilities for some of the IUS providers. The data, uh, the metadata gets harvested nightly from these different services and transformed if it needs to be into ISO, if it's not ISO already, and then it goes into a geo portal server where you can access it through CSW. And then those so different downstream sort of uh, web-based uh, applications like the IUS catalog then can populate there uh, what you see, you know, in your web client by doing a CSW search and finding out um, all the data sets that are available. So um, we're going we're to take advantage of that too. Um, the, if you go to the GUI, um, you know, if you just go to uh, NGDC's GeoPortal, you can search through all that metadata by doing things like, you know, NECOS or SOS and star temperature, and get back um, a bunch of data sets. And when you get back these data sets, they have um, this is just the metadata being represented here. This is the title and the abstract, and then the different service links appear here, in particular OpenDAP. Uh, or SOS, um, and here I've clicked on this uh, one particular model output, and it's highlighted over here. So you can you can search on time, and um, uh, you can search on you know space and keywords and stuff like that. But um, we don't really want to use a GUI because we're nerds, right? We want to we want to access this stuff programmatically. We want to be more effective, and so um, I'll show you how we're going to do that in a second. So. We're, I'm, everything I'm going to show you today is, is Python-based in terms of access. Um, there, we do have some, uh, you know, there's people who are using R and MATLAB and stuff, but but Python is a, um, it's just a really uh, nice environment for doing this kind of uh, work. And I'll, um, and the Python notebook um, is really proved super useful. So. Um, in terms of reproducibility, you know, giving somebody an IPython notebook um, uh, has been really helpful. So this is an IPython notebook that demonstrates getting data using OpenDAP and with CF. And it's a um, uh, so Iris is a is um, 
a project that's uh, from the British Met Office. Um, you can barely see that here, scitools.uk.org. Um, and this is, so this is what provides the CF capabilities for, um, for, for NetCD, for, um, for Python. So we can, we can open up one of those URLs that's an opened app URL, and yet it, it understands what the latitude and longitude coordinates are and is able to just, you can just say load, get some cubes, look at them, extract um, some data on lat lawn and time and plot it up. And, um, and for, for SOS and uh, CSW, we're using the OWS library from Tom Kurlitis, and Tom works for Environment Canada, I think in the MAT uh, area. And um, this is sort of, you know, this, this library supports WMS, WFS, WCS, um, you know, and SOS and CSW. So we make a lot of use out of this. It's been a great package. It's also had a lot of contributions from other folks, not just Tom, as you can, you can see here, <laughs> probably. He didn't, he didn't make all that money. <laughs> um, so with that, I'm going to jump into this notebook. Um, oops. Okay, I'm going to, uh, let's see, jump out of here. I'm going to go right to this notebook here. So. Um, so, so we have a notebook here that tries to basically use all those tools that I just showed you to find all the, the data that's in a particular region. Well, I'll, I'll just walk through it. Okay, so I'm not going to go, I'm not going to, you know, worry about stuff like importing pickle. <laughs> I'm just going to highlight, um, I'm going to make this a little bigger. Um, so this is a, a, a notebook actually that's running on um, Wakari Enterprise which is, um, that means it's rem running remotely. Um, the server's running remotely. I'm typing in my web browser. I'm communicating with that server that's actually down in Louisiana. And um, it's a pretty powerful machine, so um, I like computing there. And there's a lot of data that I use that are, big data that I use that are there, so I'm computing close to the data. In this case, I'm just pulling data from around, um, from uh, around IUS. But, uh, and this was, um, and Philippe actually did, um, basically constructed most of this notebook. Um, using uh, and fixing the original uh, water level notebook that I had um, starting about a year ago. So, um, so basically, um, you know, we spe the user comes in and specifies, um, you know, that they want to get data. Uh, you want it now, and the start time will be now plus four, and stop of time of um, sorry, start four days before and end four days later. And um, a bounding box here for some region that you're interested in, um, with a little extra space to look for um, data nearby, and because uh, we're going to give it some tolerance to be close to the model output, um, we want to look for seawater temperature. But this is a sneaky little uh, function here, CF names, which is actually going to um, basically use um, the names that we. Um, all the names we know of that um, that uh, that constitute seawater temperature, and this and this is going to convert everything into Celsius, um, and then basically you with that um, that data we construct a filter, okay, um, and we're going to we're going to search this endpoint here, which is the geo portal. Can everybody, can you see this? Okay, can somebody unmute and just say yes? Yes. yes. Okay, or you can you can say no too, <laughs> but you can't see it. Okay, okay. Let me just go one step up, um, and I'm hoping that um, everybody on this call is nerdy enough to like to look at code. Uh, that was that was an assumption I made. So um, so we specify the endpoint, um, and we, then we feed it this. Um, so we, then we, so we open it up, catalog service web, and we get and we get records based on a filter constraint here. Constraints equals filter list. Okay, and this filter list we've built just above here, and what this filter list is, is it says, I'm going to look for either um, or in any of uh, the names in this list which, um, which have a property, you know, um, uh, property, is, uh, property is like, so the, so the property you're looking for is like any of the names in this list. They can be any of them. So right, if you have seawater temperature, seawater potential temperature, and any of these number of lists, a number of names, um, 
we're going to um, you're going to say we're going to filter on any of those, um, but we're not going to take anything that has averages. So here we're doing some. So we basically what we did was we we did this first, right? And then we said, oh gosh, we've got some files that are just um, average averages of the other files. And this is kind of a standard thing that's going to happen, right? When we do catalog, when we have catalog-driven workflows, we're going to get essentially like duplicates and stuff, or maybe like filtered versions of the exact same data, and we're going to have to deal with them somehow. You might think that you're going to deal with them by querying the metadata, but I, I personally think, you know, we're going to get, you know, 80% of the way there with, you know, standard metadata, and then we're still going to have to do stuff like this in our workflows, you know, just to, to get to pick out some of the stuff we want or don't want. Um, because we're just never going to get there with, you know, we're never going to have 100% metadata for everything that anybody would ever want to do. <laughs> so anyway, so then we um, then we say we have a bounding box, we have a start start time and a stop time, we have a bounding box, so we and all that stuff together, so we have stuff inside the bounding box, inside that time range that has any of those names but not this name. Oh, that's a pretty sophisticated query. We do that query, that CSW can handle it. Um, we get back all the data sets that match that. We then get the, um, the service URLs from those data sets because we're looking for um, SOS services and we're looking for DAP services. Um, and then we, um, you know, we uh, basically try to figure out whether, so this is the sort of the, the uh, part of the, um, I guess the rant part is that, you know, we have to do a lot of work still here to kind of figure out what is a station uh, and what is uh, a station like um, the metadata is supposed to have in it, um, if you're fully compliant, it's supposed to say whether you're a model output or not, but a lot of data doesn't have that, and so we're trying to like figure it out in other ways. Um, actually, incidentally, there was a really nice talk yesterday on the DMAC, on a DMAC uh, webinar that was recorded about the, the CF compliance checker. Um, so there's a more sophisticated CF compliance checker that's been built. Um, and um, under IAU's funding, and it has different um, sort of profiles. It has sort of a plug-in kind of thing where you can have it check for different types of um, attributes and things like that. So it can check for ACDD attributes. Um, it can check for compliance with, I think, the NODC templates and things like that. So um, you might want to check that out. And um, if anybody's interested, just um, maybe somebody could chat. Somebody who actually could chat that into the. Um, the chat here, or just ping me after, because uh, it's pretty good, pretty interesting stuff. So that can help you actually figure. That would make our lives easier if people actually had compliant data. And here, in this part, um, we're accessing uh, the data from SOS. And here's another little ugly, ugly bit that um, you see. We're from PyUse collectors import NDBC SOS. Uh, you know, you should be thinking, what? Wait a minute. Uh, why did we? Why do we have a standard service called SOS if we need to have a special function called NDBC SOS? <laughs> and uh, and the answer is that these things are not. Also, these were old services, NDBC SOS, and 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 the um, NODC SOS were both sort of set up uh, before, or the Collapse SOS. Sorry, were both set up before. Um, with SOS was really kind of standardized, and so these are like little helper functions that basically standardize those things for us. But at least the guys who wrote this had an easier job. <laughs> Any questions on this stuff so far? Okay. Hopefully everybody's not like, you know, uh, reading their email now because they didn't really want to look at this code. Anyway, we're going to get to the result pretty soon. <laughs> but um, so here's the code, you know, here's the COOPS SOS. So, so basically, we're going to pull data. We found these, you know, we found these different stations, and we're going to pull data from them. Um, and then we're going to basically um, uh, look for model output. I'm just going to uh, skip down here. So here are these different stations that were found, and now we're going to look for um, models. And um, yeah, I'm not going to go through all these details. I think, in the interest of time. Um, but we have to do some things like try to figure out what the surface layer is, you know, um, like because sometimes in the models the layer, layer zero is the surface and sometimes the last one is the surface. Um, and then we're going to use um, Iris here to load the data and we're going to 
actually look for data that's within a certain distance of each station. So if we find data within a certain distance of the station, we're going to extract a time series from that model at, you know, and compare it, and then we're going to interpolate it all. We, got, we have it in, um, uh, basically have it in a, a data frame, a pandas data frame, so we can plot it up, do whatever we want, and, um, or we can write, the, what we do here is we just write them out to little net CDF files. And um, so I think I'm going to jump to um, actually just showing you the result at this point, and then you can ask questions um, about it. Um, get out of there. Thank you. Okay, so this one, um, this plot, this which just loads that the data. Actually, I skipped a skill score step where. Um, Philippe does nice things like calculates target diagrams, Taylor diagrams, and stuff like that. But I'm just going to um, – this basically – I'm not even going to show you this because it, all it does is um, basically loads up the data and creates this nice little um, folium uh, map here, which shows you which data uh, – I guess I have to reduce my – well, let's see. Um, if I just zoom out, I guess. Okay. Zoom out some more. So this is a, oh, uh, this is kind of cool, right? So this is a JavaScript plot being generated by Python within a, uh, a Py an IPython notebook data frame, um, and the plots have already also been calculated by Python, but they've been converted into little JavaScript plots. So you can see there are two stations here. We found four models here in Boston. This is where people care about, right? So let's take a look here. If I click on that spot, um, it should come up with the different plots. Okay, so here's a JavaScript plot again of this time series that we found. So we found um, we found four different um, models or four different data sets. This, the, the observational data, it's a little bit um, hard to see with this legend here, but working on that, uh, Philippe is working on that. Um, but anyway, this observational data is the, is the purple line here. Okay, now we're, now we're in Celsius. So 18 degrees C is that's, – that's fine. They'll be, happy. That would, they'll be happy with that. That's about 64 degrees or so. Um, and what you can see here is that model we were looking at before, it's always cold. It's been cold. It's going to be cold. That would not be a good forecast model to use. And it's interesting, right, because this is our forecast model for New England. This is the highest resolution I use forecast model we have. Um, you'd certainly want to use it for currents, but its temperature is way off. You know, it's like 10 degrees, almost 10 degrees Fahrenheit too cold. And look at this. Here's another model, a forecast model, the operational model we have running. Um, this is actually a model we're running here at USGS. It's really – its objective is not to predict sea surface temperature, but it's interesting that it's um, six degrees too warm. So it's way too warm. Um, and, you know, the, the actual um, model that's doing the best, this, this little green line here is actually interpolated SST uh, data, so that's actually more data. And this blue line here is a larger scale uh, model that the, the New England, the near Coos region of IOS is running, and it's doing pretty well, actually. So the large scale model that we ordinarily wouldn't have thought of using um, because it actually drives this model um, is actually doing the best. And so, um, you know, I think this is kind of cool for a couple of reasons. One is that it, um, it basically showed us, hey, we've got some issues with these two models. Um, and it's not what we, you know, thought um, the answer would be. And, um, and yet, and it's also useful for the swimmers because we can tell them, hey, look, you know, over the last two days it's actually gotten a little bit – it's going to get warmer. The models are not predicting some big, huge dip in temperature um, on Saturday when your race is going to run. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty – we feel pretty confident saying that the water temperatures are going to be above uh, 60, 64 degrees or 18 degrees C, whatever that exactly is. So, I, you know, that's, it's kind of a, it's a success in, in that regard, and it's also a success because I just want to, I'm going to, actually, before I jump out of this, um, does anybody have any questions about this stuff? The notebook stuff? Rich, I have a question. This is Eugene. I have a quick question. You showed two notebooks. You showed them the first notebook that you went through the code, and then you stepped into this tab. Are these separate notebooks? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is one notebook, and this is um, this is one that notebook that we have to fetch the data, 
and another notebook we have um, to do the skill score, and then we have another notebook to create the map. But you know, they could be all strung together, right? It doesn't matter. But we just it's just kind of convenient to have one that fetches the data, and then you can mess around with skill scores, right? And then you can also mess around with the plotting without doing a bunch of complicated logic in your one single notebook. Okay. Thanks. Hello. Hi, Rich. Uh, this is Lee. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my question is, are uh, this real-time data collected uh, from the sensors? Right. And uh, the model was run whenever you um, um, like uh, send the request, the SOS request. The model will also be be run and uh, show the results on the same plot. Um, well, okay. So the so the observational data here, you can see today is the 13th, um, and the observational data stops. Well, you know, pretty much now. And um, so this was pulled from the SOS server, you know, a few minutes ago. Um, this model here was run, these models are mostly run every night, and they forecast for several days. Like, so you can see this one actually, um, the model, they're, they're actually struggling a little bit with this model, and it hasn't run today, so it's not predicting anything during the race um, period yet. Um, that should happen sometime later today. But the model that forces that model has already run, and so it ran this morning, starting here, and produced a three-day forecast out to here. This model runs every day, but it only produces a one-day forecast. That, wow, this is really cool. Question? Yes, thanks. Um, and uh, I probably will uh, contact you later after this meeting, talk more okay. about the SOS service. Thanks. Sure. Um, so, you know, I just want to emphasize that if you went back, well, okay, let me let me just keep on going here. Um, but there's nothing in here specific to this region, right? You could just um, change the bounding box and look at something on the west coast. In fact, this came from um, Philippe had had a uh, notebook that he was working on in Sakura um, that we just um, adapted for you know to to do Boston because that's the idea behind all this, right? It doesn't. You don't have to do anything special. That's the goal, anyway. Um, okay, so that's. Um, I think I'll just stop. Oh, there's that. You know, there's another uh, station out here. This is an NO, NODC um, uh, buoy, and um, and here it's actually kind of interesting because um, I mean, I'm not really going to. I mean, this isn't really a science talk, but it's just kind of interesting that uh, that model that was so bad before Coast. Now it's actually doing tracking the observational data, which is now in yellow, or that kind of yellowish color, um, pretty well. And so that co the coast model is actually doing okay offshore, but inshore it's not doing very well at all. And that the model that um, should be doing the best is still doing terribly. The model that has the highest resolution. And in here it's kind of interesting because you can you can again. Um, See that uh, now. Actually, now we got HiCom coming in, so HiCom is um, only once a day, but it's not too far off. And um, and of course, the uh, the other models are the same. So um, so let me jump back to the presentation here just to finish up. Um, so that was cool, right? But what if you want to do this yourself? Because um, it's fun to watch me do it, right? But um, it's really uh, the, whole, the main point of this is to Make something that anybody can use, and um, and so what we've done to help facilitate that, or again, largely, uh, Philippe. Actually, before I, before I show you that, I just want to show you one what we found out based on this. We actually went and looked at that um, those two models, the, the lower resolution one that was doing well, that has sort of temperatures in the 60s here in Boston, which looks pretty good, and then we looked at the high resolution one. So this is the parent model, and it's driving this child model. Wow. So the child model. It's being driven on the boundary with the parent model with the correct temperature, but interior, the interior is way too cold. And it turns out that um, in that in the other model, we uh, you know over the last two days I've been talking with the modelers, and um, this model assimilates sea surface temperature data, and this one doesn't. And so basically, it means that the, uh, the sea surface temperature must be covering up for a lot of sins in the 
probably in the shortwave radiation or something else that's getting the that's resulting in this water just getting to, way too cold. Anyway, science tidbit. Okay, so what have we done to make this easy for you to run? So I would like you to be able to go just run this yourself after this webinar, um, and you can. You should be able to. Um, if you Google on rsignal usgs or OSEF, OSEF path, Philippe, are you on the line? Uh, he might not be on the line. Okay. Well, anyway, I, I, I still don't know what OSEF, OSEF path means. But anyway, that's, that's Philippe and GitHub. Um, you'll find all this stuff, and in fact, at Philippe's um, GitHub site, you'll find um, the Boston Light Swim repo, which has um, which has the uh, instructions for how you install this yourself, and you can really do it, and you should be able to do it in less than 15 minutes on any platform. Um, but we might have some, we might have a Windows issue or something right now. I'm not sure. Oh, I think there's some Windows. Yeah, so there's there might be some Windows. Um, issue with closing files or something, something that's supposed to be part of a standard Python that doesn't work in a standard way on <laughs> Windows or something. Um, but, but everything we've built, so what we've done is um, everything that ne needs to be, every package that you need in your environment to run that notebook, and there's a lot of them, we have distributed on this anaconda.org um, IUSE channel. So we have 144 packages here, and they're built for um, for Windows, Mac, and Linux. So they, um, if you want to run this notebook, you know, it's, it's one thing to have a um, standard so you can access the data. It's great. That's fantastic. It's also, we also, for reproducibility and shareability, we need notebooks like, you know, we need to see the code, right? So we need the notebooks. But then we also need the environment. We need the computing environment to run the notebook. And that involves all these um, lots of sort of packages that may be easy to install, may be hard to install, and this has been sort of the bane of, you know, a lot of people started trying to use Python and, and got frustrated because they of packaging problems. You know, they couldn't get something to run on their, um, you know, Mac OS, and um, that somebody else on Linux could, and anyway, this, this has solved a lot of problems, um, having a place where you can build binaries, uh, packages, that you can just install and run. Um, and so all of these exist, on, almost all of them exist on every platform. And so um, if you go um, in the, in the, actually in the Conda, um, in, on GitHub and under the IUSE channel, under Conda recipes, you can see um, how uh, we build all these packages. And on the wiki there, you can, um, there's instructions that we give people when they say, hey, how do I install Python? We say do this, um, and it's got instructions for getting downloading the free Anaconda distribution, and then installing all the packages from our IUSE channel that you need to run these kind of notebooks. Oh wait, I'm not I'm not really in presenter mode, am I? <laughs> um, let me jump in there. Okay, so so on this again, just you know, there's instructions here for the different platforms, and if you have an issue, you have any problems here, you can raise an issue and say, hey. I, um, I stumbled a bit. What's going on? And we'll try to help you. Um, so, you know, in summary, um, we've got standards, you know, services, catalogs. They all help us serve data, serve data in a unified way. But in Python and tools like it, give us free scientific access, analysis, and visualization environments, which we can use to do searches, access the data, do analysis, make the plots. The notebooks give us this sort of documented workflow so that we can just hand you a workbook. You can see exactly how everything works. You can also, as I was sort of mentioning, you can use it from your browser. You use it from your browser. You can have the server running locally. If you follow those instructions, you'll be running your own notebook server. But you can also take advantage of, of people who have set up servers that are running at other places like, um, oh, yeah, this is this is a joke. Yeah, I wanted to have the Windows update pop up in the middle of my pro presentation. <laughs> Um, okay, <laughs> so um, you know it's really cool to be able to do the computations in the notebook really close to the data when you're dealing with big data. So we use that um, in the IUS uh, coastal ocean modeling testbed. In this case, we're, we're not using that, but it's just a cool feature. Um, so Anaconda and Anaconda.org really are super useful because it really lets someone in about 15 minutes just duplicate your whole environment, install Python, and set up a, an environment that has all the packages that you need to run that particular notebook. And in the end, I think you get 
um, you know, more efficient and effective access to ocean data and make it possible for anybody to really do this kind of assessment. And I think that's really huge. When we get people like ocean swimmers, you know, running, uh, you know, in a, a notebook, maybe we make, the, make, maybe we make a nice little, you know, interface to that the kind of notebook or make it really simple for people to modify it. But actually the, the swimmer who I've been working with, I shared it, um, a notebook with him on uh, Wakari and he just logs in and he changes the bounding box. He doesn't understand any of the code, but he can change a bounding box and he can change a time. So he's been looking at different offshore swimming locations um, using these tools. So I think it's, you know, and of course we could put a, um, turn them into just regular Python code and put a nice little front end on them or something. But um, anyway, that's, uh, that's the reproducible workbook story. Um, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Rich, that was great. Um, I have a quick question to, uh, to start things off. Um, so the anaconda.oregon in the IUS channel or whatever makes it really easy to install everything you need uh, locally anyway. Is that the case for, what about in Wakari? How do you set up a Wakari environment with all this? So um, if you're using just like the public Wakari, um, uh -huh. you can open up, actually either either one. I mean, we're, we're, use, we're using, um, the public Wakari is a little bit um, can be a little bit flaky, but it you know has the advantage of being completely free for now anyway. Um, but in, in in that or Wakari Enterprise, which we're also using on the test bed, you you just open up a terminal, and in the terminal you just type the same commands that you'd type if you were you know installing it on your local um, Windows or Mac or Linux machine. It's the same thing. So you just create a new <clears throat> you just create a new environment, and you know when you say conda create dash n and you create a new environment and then you can switch in Wakari, you can just pick which environment you want to run your notebook in. Okay. Philippe, are, are you on the line? Uh, okay, are you muted? <laughs> or maybe. Is your internet connection so crappy down there in Brazil that you can't talk? <laughs> no audio. <laughs> okay. Well, I was hoping <laughs> I was hoping Philippe could um, talk about all you know, mention all the stuff that I forgot to talk about. But um, anyway, uh, I mean, it it really is not. It should be clear that it's not really limited to ocean data either, right? I mean, um, that all that stuff, same stuff would work for any of the Met. Any met? Oh, oh, actually, I know what I wanted to. Well, are there any more questions? I, I did want to say one more thing about if, like, you want to implement this yourself. Yeah, actually, I had a question, uh, Rich. It was about uh, about when you were accessing the CSW um, web services. So I, I, I'm assuming they were web services, anyways. Yeah. Um, and so you were querying the catalogs and doing some pretty sophisticated stuff, and it kind of kind of zipped by me. Um, partly because I was looking at some other code. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I like code. It wasn't email. Um, but anyway, um, but I, I wondered, you know, like, so where are those CSW servers running and yeah. how do they correlate with uh, OpenDAP and SOS uh, data source, the data that are accessed through OpenDAP and SOS? In yeah. This example. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so CSW um, basically is, uh, you know, you're obviously like any other OGC service. You're free to, you know, develop it uh, the same way, just like you guys have developed your HiRax OpenDAP and, you know, Unidata did their Threads OpenDAP. It's just a, a service that other people, different people yeah. can set up. So, there's different implementations of CSW around. And um, so, if you install a GeoPortal server like the one I was showing, it has a CSW interface. Um, mm. You can install Pi CSW, which is a Python-based CSW service, which actually I was going to mention because if you thought, oh, I'd love to do this, except, wait a minute, my stuff is not in this I use catalog, right? You'd say, hey, I have yeah. a bunch of folks I deal with who have high racks and threads, you know, servers, and I just want to, I want to bring in all that metadata and put it in a database and search it with CSW. Well, Pi CSW um, is a really cool thing that I actually um, I, I use it when um, outside of I use um, uh, and uh, it, it's super easy to set up. It's all Python based, um, 
and uh, it installs in like five minutes. And I, like I don't know anything about databases, and uh, <laughs> but it's all command. It's all command line driven. But if you do know about databases, you can connect it. I think it uses uh, SQL Lite or something as a default. Probably. Database. You can hook it. You can hook it into other um, databases, and so basically, you're querying a database of metadata. So you can. So PyCSW, you create ISO metadata, um, or you can. Uh, so actually, what we do a lot is we um, we crawl uh, we crawl our um, our threads catalogs or you know or or high racks catalogs, and um, and extract. Um, this is, you can actually point NC ISO. You could run NC ISO on its own and point it at any OpenDAP. Um, or any any kind of uh, threads catalog, and it'll crawl the catalog, produce ISO metadata, um, and then we, um, or if you have the ISO services running, you could just crawl it with a threads crawler and extract uh, the ISO metadata that way. So you have all this, you have a collection of ISO metadata. PyCSW, you run PyCSW, and it sucks up that ISO metadata, sticks it in the database. You do CSW request, and um, it. Uh, um, and it, it you know it returns metadata, but the, in the in the yeah. metadata are the service endpoints, you know, OpenDAP and um, and and SOS stuff like that. So that's yeah. the that's the holy grail, right? That's what that meant to, to me is that we go, you know, in the future we go to data.gov, we do these CSW requests, we get back our OpenDAP links and our CSW links and our WMS links, and we do cool stuff with them because we know what these things are serving. The services are you know working as expected and the you know the metadata is sufficient enough that we can do cool, you know, stuff driven by a catalog search of, you know, at the beginning because there's so much. There's, I mean, I didn't even know that that SST product existed. Um, it just came in on the catalog, you know, when we queried, and um, and that's yeah, that's pretty weird. intense. Yeah, and we were doing water levels. We'd be like, you know, I was looking at three water levels one day, and I ran my script again. Another one popped in because somebody registered their model. I had no idea that they had a model. But it, the, and it popped, you know. It's just so it's cool. That is. So I have a couple more questions about CSW. Yeah. I don't want to monopolize the meeting, though. So maybe if other people want to, I'll, I'll I'll make them brief, and you can either say I'll answer it offline or whatever. But um, do you know if there's a way for CSW to assimilate stuff from remote CSWs? Like, for example, can a centralized CSW? Be told yeah. there are these 1,500 CSWs out there. Just go get their stuff. Mm -hmm. you, do you know if that's possible? Yeah, it, is, it totally is. Yeah. So yeah, that's called, and that's so federated, and you can actually that's a federated search, right? Where you when you actually do the search yeah. on one CSW, it goes out and searches other CSWs. Or you can also just have uh, them harvest from other CSWs. Yeah. I was actually talking about the latter, but both options are pretty interesting. Yeah. So, um, how, so CSW is can certainly be populated with the kind of information that comes out of the combination of threads and NC ISO. Is Absolutely. it is it correct op for is, is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. I mean, yeah. the yeah. only thing is that you know, like some, I mean, you have to basically the most important things obviously are um, are having the um, you know the latitude uh, longitude you know latitude longitude <laughs> range time range um, the list of sure. you know what the variables. But of course, that just comes from an OpenDAP data set, right? It can calculate um, if yeah. with CF conventions. It knows enough. NCISO can just calculate those ranges, even if they're not supplied, and create the metadata elements that describe the extents based on the data. Right, right. Yeah, that's really that's pretty cool. Wow, yeah. that is kind of the holy grail, or it's getting yeah. grail-like. So it if is. we I were, mean, if so, so if if um, if Unidata and OpenDAP and maybe um, maybe the ERDAP folks too. If they if we were all to stop to start supporting CSW endpoints in the servers that we're releasing, that might push this whole process along quite a bit faster, huh? Yeah, I mean you don't have to. I mean you don't have to support a CSW service, right? You don't have to do anything really. I mean you're already supporting. Um, it's really the. I mean anybody can start up. Or, or maybe you're saying as a community we could start yeah. up a, a CSW that would. That people could register their different threads or high racks or SOS or ERDAP endpoints, um, and you know something something larger than I use maybe, but smaller than data.gov or something. 
<laughs> yeah, something along those lines, although I was also thinking in particular that a, a server can crawl its own local holdings far faster than something out on a web. Oh, I see. Them. Okay, so I see. Create a create a, a folder of metadata that people could just access. Exactly, and since there okay. is this sort of federated and harvesting mode to CSW, then you could have various kinds of centralized ones, and they could be told to just go to this place and harvest it, or you can federate to it. But if you've got potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of granules behind one of these servers, um, it's much nicer to crawl them there than it is to try to crawl them over the web because that could take weeks or months. Actually, you know, that's so that's actually a good point. That was one of the lessons learned on um, in the in the IUS um, experiments was that it's much more effective to have people create their own different organizations create their own uh, web accessible folders of ISO metadata than to try to crawl everybody's threads in high racks and whatever services every night because. Um, not only do you end up, you, each group can say, hey, wait a minute, you know, I actually don't want to, you know, read the 1,000 um, granules that are actually part of this aggregation. You know, they can be more, um, you know, they can be more skillful in the, um, in crafting the ISO records that they actually want to have consumed. Uh, and then, uh, you know, then you can just basically register the, the web accessible folder endpoint of ISO metadata. And that's much more effective, and then there's much less work for the centralized you know, gatherer to do. It's easy to read ISO metadata. It's, it takes more time to crawl a catalog and you know, read data to compute extents and stuff. Exactly, yeah. Uh, I was just going to mention that I think Philippe uh, uh, and Typed in some stuff in the chat. This oh. is uh, he, it's too noisy where he is to turn on his mic, but he did want to say that uh, uh, things should work and all these notebooks should work on Windows now. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. I mean, yeah. you know, that, that was a little bit. I, I'm glad. That, I'm glad he's um, chiming in on that because um, you know there. Are, I don't want to make it sound like it, it's really cool that there's so much stuff that works on Windows now that uh, I mean basically everything works on Windows that used to, you know, there used to be a lot of stuff that didn't work very well on Windows. And in the last year or so, I think the combination of um, being able to build stuff on Anaconda and kind of folks teaming together who know how to build stuff um, on Windows have really made a huge difference. And, um, you know, you should, yeah, you should be able to run anything on that IUS channel on Windows. Um, and uh, yeah, that's great. So, yeah, actually, I'm going to go try that. <laughs> <laughs> after this uh, telecon, but um, please give this stuff a try. I guess I just want to say that, um, you know, try try running it yourself. Just try running the, exactly that same notebook, but then try, you know, going to a different region and running it. Try, you know, looking for salinity or do, some, do something else, you know, modify it. And, and please, if you do um, run into issues or you make improvements, just raise issues on, um, on GitHub um, and, It'll, you know, we'll build a, we'll build a better world together. Great. Well, thanks very much, uh, Rich. Uh, does anybody else out there have uh, more questions? All right. I'll, I'll make a plug for the rants and raves and say, uh, if anybody else out there has ideas about who or what should be presented or wants to present something. Please let me know. This is Ethan, by the way, uh, and uh, my email is edavis at ucar.edu. If that, uh, so let me know. All right. Thanks a lot, Ethan. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I guess uh, Eugene, I see you just popped up. Do you have a question there, or? Oh, I just want to say thanks. This is great. Very. Very All right. Nice. All right. So I guess we can sign off and. Uh, Thanks again, Rich, for a very great presentation. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you later. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. Rich. Thank you. Bye.